here. Um, author of five novels, one of which is Hallucinating Foucault, who, unlike the last seminar one, nobody had read the book. I recommended that everybody read, and uh, hopefully everyone had a chance to. Um, winner of the McKissick Prize and the Dylan's First Fiction Prize uh, Award, sorry, James Miranda Barry, um, focusing on the life of Victorian, except it's not Victorian, is it? Uh, Doctor no. looking at um, almost Victorian, almost Victorian, half yeah. Victorian. The deadly space between um, her fourth novel, Miss Webster and Sharif, was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers Prize. Uh, Patricia has also published two very good collections of short fiction and um, a numerous amounts of critical work. Um, and I'm very pleased to have been informed that her fifth novel, The Strange Case of the Composer and His Judge, will be published in March by the Newsbury, which I very much look forward to. And uh, Patricia is Professor of Contemporary Literature at the University of Manchester. Thank you. Um, I'll pass around some handouts, because I'm going to talk about, a bit about Shakespeare. And I thought you might not all have Shakespeare at your fingertips immediately. Can I just see, who here is in, would say they were in literary studies and who would say they were, oh, yeah, and who would say they were in medical, psychiatry? And other, 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 yes, who is in other? Oh, quite a lot of other, good, right. Some are in both, I think. Yeah, some are in both, that's fantastic. Okay, I'll um, pass this round. I'm sorry, I did these very late last night where I was, um, had a... To deal with the budget, so I had a hysterical evening yesterday, and one of my students is here, Rebecca, which is really nice. Actually, Sean, can you just give I those shall. to everybody? You know, thanks. Well, I think, thank you, Charlie, and I think you got us off to a flying start, because <laughs> I think it's all so controversial, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's terribly uh, interesting issues. I mean, I wrote down things like, you know, I got suddenly worried about symptom spotting, because I thought, you know, my God, you looking at Hamlet, is Hamlet mad? No, he is melancholy. And melancholy has a, a completely different meaning in the 16th century to what it has now. And it wouldn't, it would have... He projects the set of symptoms, which everyone would have recognized, which were completely literary symptoms. And if you didn't have them, once they were fashionable, you sought to have them, which is rather like that lovely woman who said, you know, the politics of cruelty, I'm in there. You know, the cruelest cut, I'll let me do it. Right, well, I'm coming from entirely a literary background, uh, although I did do quite a lot of research into the French psychiatric system when I wrote Hallucinating Foucault, which I'm very happy to talk about, but I would see it as anecdotal and actually not really very much to do with the novel. It is just, you know, interesting gossip as to how I got in there because the French, as those of you who know anything about the French medical system, we lock people up. If you show signs of depression, you are immediately locked up. So getting into these places is actually very difficult, and you do have to have an insider to take you in. But I'm going to, to start properly with just... Can you all hear me? Sorry, I've got to keep flinging this thing around. Um, with Shakespeare, because that's where hallucinating com Foucault comes from. Let me begin with Shakespeare. A Midsummer Night's Dream recounts a night of sexual mayhem in the woods, a league from Athens... The fairies are locked in battle for the possession of a little Indian boy. The human lovers are quick, bright things, tangled in amorous confusion. Lysander loves Hermia, but so does Demetrius, who used to love Helena until he set eyes on Hermia. And alas, poor Helena, she still adores Demetrius, who now doesn't love her anymore. Desire falls victim <coughs> to the fairies' interference. Titania, the fairy queen, is duped and drugged by her lord Oberon, so that she falls in love with Bottom the Weaver, disguised as an ass. Quick plot summary. The players, hidden in the woods to rehearse in private, are also overtaken by magical disaster. Ridicule, humiliation, love potions, and mistaken identities transform the lives of both mortals and immortals in the night woods. Act 5 
supposedly sees order restored. The lovers are married off to the correct partners, and the audience is treated to royal wedding celebrations and entertainments. The mechanicals deliver their play in a hectic, if slightly over-explanatory performance, and are generously applauded by the nobles. And it's right at the beginning of Act 5 that Theseus sounds off about the relationship between the lunatic, the lover, and the poet. His new wife, the conquered Amazon Hippolyta, ventures to comment, "'Tis strange, my Theseus, that these lovers speak of." And Theseus manages to be both pompous and dismissive. And here is his great speech on the imagination. More strange than true, I never may believe these antic fables nor these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies, that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold, that is, the madman. The lover, all as frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Such tricks hath strong imagination that if it would but apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. Or in the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed a bear. Theseus dismisses lunatics, lovers, and poets in one breath, even as he draws them all together. Creative inspiration, sexual passion, and madness all create unnecessary worlds and turn bushes into bears. Now, Theseus ignores Hippolyta's objection. She says, But all the story of the night told over, and all their minds transfigured so together, more witnesseth than fancy's images, and grows to something of great constancy, but howsoever strange and admirable. Now, I would argue this is the voice of cool reason that has listened to the story of the night and reached somewhat different conclusions to those of Theseus. And I would say that men in Shakespeare's plays ignore women at their peril. Now, Hallucinating Foucault begins and ends with dreams. Many of the characters are unnamed. The narrator, the Germanist, the Bank of England. Now, when a character is unnamed, the reader's attention shifts, or should shift, from identity to role, just as we do in fairy tales. You know how in fairy tales you usually only have one character named, like Rumpelstiltskin. Everyone else is the miller, the miller's daughter. And you'll see the same thing happens with stories like Puss in Boots. Once upon a time, there was a miller who had three sons. The only person who's named is the Puss in Boots. And then when the miller transforms his identity and becomes the Marquis of Carabar, which the miller's son, which in fact he isn't, he then gains a name. Who the characters are proves to be, and should be, far less important than what they represent. And as in Renaissance drama or in 18th century fiction, my plot is crucial and will give the reader meanings. And this is very interesting, I think, coming out of, the, of what Charlie was saying earlier, because plot, the actual structuring of the narrative and the causality of the narrative, I think for me is terribly, terribly important. And it's not something that people look for now in fiction. I wanted the text of Hallucinating Foucault, however extraordinary the tale, to grow to something of great constancy. My character, Paul Michel, actually refers to Theseus's extraordinary speech more than once in Hallucinating Foucault. And the clearest reference comes towards the end of the novel when the unnamed student refuses to acknowledge that the summer will end and that he must be parted from the writer he now loves. And Paul Michel, this is Paul Michel speaking, and he's being rather brutal. So, you will take me back to the loving care of Pascal Vaury and her cohort of sadists. 
You will then proceed to England, marching with military precision, and take up your studies again. You will write to me whenever your schedule allows, usually with academic queries on my texts. Is that clear? I lost my temper. No, it's not clear. There's no way that I'm letting you get locked up again in that inferno. We'll get you past the medical commission, and then we'll go back to Paris. We'll find somewhere to live. I'll get a job or something. You have to start writing again. He let out a wild cackle of laughter and dropped my hands. Ah, well, in that case, he lit a cigarette. My God, Petit, you ought to be riding a white horse and bearing an ensign. You take your role of savior far too seriously. I got up and left him there in the cafe. I didn't want him to see that I was crying with anger, frustration, and pain. He left me alone on the beach for an hour or so. Then he came down and rubbed wet sand onto my back. I hadn't heard him approaching. Listen, Betty, he said gently. You were 22 and very much in love. I am 46 and a certified lunatic. You are much more likely to be insane than I am. I couldn't help it. I laughed. Here, Paul Michel acknowledges the gift of love, but he hides his answer behind Shakespeare's ironies. What links the lunatic, the lover, and the poet in Theseus's argument is that they are all deluded people. They misunderstand and misinterpret reality, not only because they lack cool reason, but also because they suffer from seething brains. They all possess imagination which, through a process of transformation, not only enables them to create fictive worlds, but also to believe that those worlds are real and true. Notice that Hippolyta uses still more powerful religious language than Theseus does. Transfigured, witnesseth. The student both imagines and believes that there is a future for himself and the man with whom he has fallen in love. But the mad writer and the student who came to find him, for them, there's no future beyond the one that continues through the texts that exist when the novel ends. Paul Michel's writing and the doctoral thesis on his work. For behind every book stands not just another book, but a dense web of texts. A Midsummer Night's Dream is not the only play lurking behind hallucinating Foucault. There is also King Lear, where madness becomes a metaphor, not for passion and creative inspiration, but for the disintegration of the state and the body politic. And I think you have got this quote on your sheets. Yep. This is Paul Michel going on and on and on. Have you read what Foucault wrote about Bedlam? Madness is theater, a spectacle. We have very few words to designate what we mean by madness in French. You, the English, you have a galaxy of words for the demented. Crazy, foolish, simple, idiotic, rabid, distracted, mad, manic, absurd, insane. It's important to traverse all those meanings. Look at you, Petit. Only a madman would have come all the way to Clermont to find someone who had been incarcerated for nearly 10 years with so little hope of ever finding me, without knowing whom you would find. He looked at me carefully. Madness and passion have always been interchangeable throughout the entire Western literary tradition. Madness is an abundance of existence. Madness is a way of asking difficult questions. What did he mean, the powerless tyrant king? Oh fool, I shall go mad. <coughs> now Paul Michel's riff on the possible significance of madness traverses the different languages and registers which have always been abundant and are still used to describe seething brains. States of madness are sometimes accepted in the social world and sometimes excluded from all company. And this is something that I was very interested in when I was investigating um, the medical health system in France because a lot of unacceptable beha behavior which comes from alcohol is accepted. But that which comes from clinically deranged conditions is not, even when it's the same behavior which I found quite hard to get my head around. Anyway, the clinical definitions, which I'm sure is something that many of you here are expert on, will, and you will all know this, that they're both fluid and dangerous. What are the origins of madness? 
And it seems to me that that question is crucial because depending on the answer that we choose, we decide whether it is to be tolerated or treated and cured. What did he mean, the powerless tyrant king? Oh fool, I shall go mad. Well, what he means there is that the world has just been turned upside down so that just as Gloucester cannot see until he's blind, so Lear cannot grasp the truth until he is mad. And here is one thing that I would insist on. Madness as a metaphor cannot be separated from the work within which it is represented. The metaphoric meanings and sources are as fluid and unstable as the, critical, the clinical conditions. So, Shakespeare sits at my elbow, by my left hand, I am left-handed. His poetry remains a touchstone, just as it does for Michel Foucault in his early work, Folie et des raisons, which he published in 1961. It's very strangely retitled in English. I appeal to my French colleague here as Madness and Civilization. Although the second edition, I think it's the second edition, is called Histoire de la Folie, which um, I'm very grateful to because that helped with titling hallucinating Foucault in French because French, um, a verb like hallucinating is very difficult to translate into French. So in French it's called La Folie Foucault which picks up the title of Foucault about which I was delighted. Now, um, you have a bit of Foucault on your sheets here. In an interview with Le Monde in 1961, Foucault said this about his study of madness, and I'm emphasizing 1961, the fact that this is an early book, that it's a 60s book. R.D. Lang is still to come, unless you put it back into that context. I think what he says here doesn't make terribly much sense. Madness only exists in society. It does not exist outside of the forms of sensibility that isolate it and the forms of repulsion that expel it or capture it. Thus one can say that from the Middle Ages up to the Renaissance, madness was present within the social horizon as an aesthetic and mundane fact. Then in the 17th century, starting with the confinement of the mad, madness underwent a period of silence, of exclusion. It lost the function of manifestation, of revelation, that it had had in the age of Shakespeare and Cervantes. For example, Lady Macbeth begins to speak the truth when she becomes mad. It becomes laughable, delusory. Finally, the 20th century collars madness, reduces it to a natural phenomenon linked to the truth of the world. From this positivist expropriation derive both the misguided philanthropy that all psychiatry exhibits towards the mad and the lyrical protest that one finds in poetry from Nerval to Arto and which is an effort to restore to the experience of madness the profundity and power of revelation that was extinguished by confinement. Profundity, power of revelation. Now these are strong words to describe madness and its function, the idea that madness should have a function is in itself something I think we can discuss. And it is perhaps the point where I would separate myself and my views from those of Foucault. The power of revelation begs many questions. What is revealed and to whom? The writing that is art is about judgment and selection. When Paul Michel goes mad, he ceases to write. But he does scrawl messages across the walls of the asylum. These are not without meaning. The writing on the wall is not art, but a warning. Now I'm going to have rather a spatial turn, which is really in homage to Rebecca, who's here with us, because she's working on space in fiction. And I've been thinking about her work, and I thought this is so interesting. I shall think about it too. The most abstract spaces in the construction of fiction, I think, are the most dangerous. And there are two spaces of which I'm constantly aware, two spaces that require constant, careful negotiation. And the first is the space between texts. I make my work out of gaps, the gaps within and between other books. My reading is easily the most important thing that I will do every day. Like Charlie, I'm a voracious reader. And so that deadly space between texts, which is the space of influence and anxiety, is the first and most crucial terrain upon which I work. 
But the space between texts is the space where every writer can take risks and be supported doing so, because it is not empty space. The space between texts has signposts and landmarks, if you like, emotional textu textual markers. It has maps, it has directions. It's a space that has per precise parameters, it's both known and strange, and it's a space that can be reclaimed by rereading. The second space, however, is the most dangerous space of all because it's the space where meaning is created and that is the space between the writer and the reader. And that shared space is the page. Now, meaning is constructed out of a relationship that has to be imagined before it can be negotiated. The writing will imagine and create its own reader. As a writer, your contract with the reader must be at the forefront of your mind. It is a contract that must be continually renegotiated, but never broken. And this is the central subject of hallucinating Foucault, the precarious link between the writer and the reader. Paul Michel is, in fact, the doppelganger of Michel Foucault. Paul Michel was Foucault's real name. His real name was Paul Michel Foucault. And the book is about a ghostly haunting. The two men haunt one another. And I think I did put this quote on the paper. Yeah, I did. It's, on your, it's the next quotation on your sheet. It's rare to find another man whose mind works through the same codes, whose work is as anonymous yet as personal and lucid as your own, especially a contemporary. It's more usual to find the echo of your own voice in the past. You're always listening, I think, when you write to the vo for the voice that answers, however oblique the reply may be. Foucault never attempted to contact me. He did something more frightening, provocative, profound. He wrote back in his published work. Many people have observed that our themes are disturbingly similar, our styles of writing utterly different. We read one another with the passion of lovers. Then we began to write to one another, text for text. I went to all his public lectures at the Collège de France. He saw me there. He gave no sign. He was teaching in California when I was in America for the publication of Midi. I went to his seminars. There were over 170 people there. Once I was slightly late. He was standing silent at the lectern, looking at his notes when I joined the crowd standing at the back of the hall. He looked up and we stared at one another. Then he began to speak. He never acknowledged me. He always knew when I was there. This passage is in fact about the illusory nature of the relationship between the writer and the reader. It is indeed a complex hallucination. Paul Michel, who is the handsome outlaw writer who openly lived that life of abandonment and excess which Foucault lived in secret, insists that he is the wish made flesh, Foucault's own desires unleashed into the world. Both men are writers, but they are also each other's reader. Now, is this pact real? When you look at that passage, it's Paul Michel speaking. I don't know about all of you who, those of you who are academics and lecturers, I mean, you always tend to look at the person who's come in late, don't you? And because they've held you up, you haven't had the door shut. So does Foucault know about this pact? And is this likely? Or are we simply inside that kind of book where writers and readers concoct hidden pacts with one another? Or is this another way of reading? a writing back that is both argument and interpretation. The book raises but never answers these questions. And I can usually tell what sort of person has read Hallucinating Foucault if they think the pact is real or if they question it. it tells you everything about their way of reading. All the locations in Hallucinating Foucault are spaces that have been theorized, discussed, and reconfigured both by Foucault himself and by other French historians and political theorists. And they are the library, 
the archive, and the asylum. And for those of us who are old enough and can still remember Louis Althusser and his ideological state apparatuses, I'm thinking of Lenin and other essays, Ideology and Ideological State Apparatuses, 1970, they are all ISAs. The library and the archive are not necessarily museums of knowledge, but instruments for the social control of knowledge and the restriction of its use. I reread um, the ISAs, and it's not a ha um, by hazard that I mention Althusser because he was also in my mind when I wrote Hallucinating Foucault, because of course he ended his life incarcerated in a madhouse in France, having strangled his wife. Whether that was a, a wise thing to do or not, we will never know. Obviously very rude. Anyway, back to the library and the archive. I feel this, this is something that was terribly important to me, and I, I've noticed very few people ever talk about it. But both the library and the archive are spaces of enchantment and entrapment. They are the magic castles of fairy tale. But they're also spaces where the forces which control and govern them are largely invisible. And I'm just going to read you the bit where the student attempts to gain access to Paul Michel's le letters to Foucault in the archive, because this section is about the control of knowledge. He goes to the archive in Paris. He finds the one box which is there, which has um, Foucault, which is Paul Michel's letters to Foucault, asks to read them and told he can't. Is told he can't. These letters are on reserve, she said. That's the archivist. I don't think you can see them. On reserve? Yes, there's another scholar working on them. These letters are not available for consultation. Anyone who's ever worked in France will know that always the first thing you get is no. Whenever you get asked for any book, asked to see any map, asked to look at any picture, no. And also, I've never heard of you. You know, you say, but I've written three letters. I've faxed them. I sent you an email. No, I've never heard of you. It's always the first reaction. And usually by someone who's busy doing their fingernails. Anyway, you can see I have had many frustrating hours in French archives. So she says a, they're not available for consultation. Is he or she working on them now? They are on reserve for publication, she hissed. I suddenly turned obstinate. But I only want to read them. I'll have to check. She disappeared again. I sat down in a rage. I had come all the way to Paris to read these letters. I glared at the innocent executive American who had no obvious designs on either Foucault or Paul Michel. Eventually, the secretary returned. She chanted a formula. The letters in question have been purchased for publication by Harvard University Press, all rights reserved. You may read the manuscripts, but photography, photocopying, or reproduction of any passage therefrom is forbidden. You will be required to sign an undertaking to that effect. In addition, you must make a detailed declaration concerning your reasons for wishing to read these manuscripts and the use you intend to make of the information contained therein. All publication, including precy, abstract, or detailed commentary in any form whatsoever, is forbidden. This declaration will be forwarded along with your name, status, and institutional address to the holders of the copyright. This declaration will have legal force. I nodded. Go into the reading room and choose a seat. I sharpened my pencils very, very carefully while she stood over me, taking all the time in the world. Then I bowed with obnoxious politeness. I had turned love 15 into 15 all. Now, the student's encounter with bureaucracy at the archive reveals two things. The actual material body of the writing is owned. It has become a commercial literary product. But what cannot be owned or controlled is the creation and interpretation of meaning. Reading is anarchic, unfettered, and subversive. The student inserts a version of his reading as measurement between himself and the archive authorities. She says, why are you reading these things? And he claims to be counting how many times Paul Michel uses the conditional. But he is, in fact, reading with the heart. Now, this is the most dangerous kind of reading anyone can undertake. 
because it is the reading that is closest to hallucination. He believes that the letters reveal themselves to him. I believe that I was capable of reading them differently to anyone else. The student has become trapped in the deadly space between the reader and the text. His gesture, setting out to find Paul Michel, is the moment of error and entrapment. The most dangerous method of reading is informed by the imagination and the heart. But just as the reader cannot be kept within boundaries, neither can the imagination. The first scene I wrote when I began the book was the encounter between the mad writer and the reader who set out to find him. And this remains, in many ways, the key moment in the narrative when they meet for the first time, because Paul Michel makes clear that he is entirely aware of his metaphoric identity. This is the student. And they told me in Paris that you keep getting out, though I can't see how. He smiled again, the same wonderful, transforming smile. Voila, he said. It's a professional secret. You can imprison the imagination. You can drug it into oblivion. You can even drive it mad. But you cannot keep it locked up. The library, the archive, and the asylum are all closed spaces. They are all indoors. There's a peculiar and arresting tension throughout British literature between indoors and outdoors. We have inherited a strongly class-marked language. And I notice that indoors, inside, all the houses, courts, castles, and palaces we are, as readers, usually forced to occupy strongly class-marked policed spaces. Whereas outdoors, the usual hierarchies break down. Gendered spaces collapse into one another. The lady chats to the peasant and the courtiers change places with the gardeners. Open space is free space. The wilderness sets its own rules and quite different structures of power suddenly assume ascendancy over the characters in any drama or fiction. Let me return to Shakespeare. The woods outside Athens in A Midsummer Night's Dream are a dangerous but liberated space. The fairies become the unseen agents of power and transformation. The lovers change places. These woods represent not only the unconscious night world of dreams and desires, but also the imagination. Theseus is gazing at bears and seeing only bushes. The Forest of Arden in As You Like It translates the court into an unwilling band of merry men in the greenwood. Pastoral romantic comedy always does create a world where class and gender are subverted and disrupted by desire. Forster and Lawrence knew this. We're in Nottingham, after all, so here I come back to the Greenwood. They exploited the possibilities offered by the woods, fields, and forests of England. Their working-class lovers are masters in open space. The prize they offer to the trapped heroine in Lady Chatterley's Lover and the hero in Maurice is the same. Sexual liberty in the green world. But this world turned upside down also offers the possibility of a virgin space in which to imagine a commonwealth that is both more honest and more just. Sometimes outdoors becomes the menacing sexual space of the woman's undoing. In Jane Austen's Mansfield Park, the walk in the wilderness leads outwards towards a landscape into which Maria Bertram and Henry Crawford actually do disappear. Jane Austen is always seen as not writing about sex, but I mean, it's all about balls soldiers and balls. She's quite clear about that. And there's a wonderful section in Mansfield Park where I couldn't believe what I was reading because they go out into this sexual landscape with a rising knoll and a furry bit at the top. Unbelievable. Anyway, um, the, what happens there is that Miss Mariah's fiancé, Mr. Rushworth, takes too long fetching the key. And their exit is accompanied by a quite explicit tempter's speech from Henry Crawford who says, 
And for the world, you would not get out without the key and without Mr. Rushworth's authority and protection. You can hear this, can't you? This is Satan's voice, isn't it? You know, you want to stay within bounds. Or I think you might, with little difficulty, pass round the edge of the gate here with my assistance. I think it might be done if you really wish to be more at large and could allow yourself to think it not prohibited. They leave the park actually unchaperoned. Outdoors, for women who really wish to be more at large, can prove fatal, of course, because Tess, Tess of the D'Urbervilles is seduced and betrayed in the ancient chase, and the outdoor space of the Colosseum in Henry James's Daisy Miller proves both fatal to the heroine's reputation and her life. Now, the reason that I've spent a long time in establishing this is this, that hallucinating Foucault is about escaping from internal lot spaces. It's about getting out of the asylum and escaping from the definitions that have been placed upon you. Open space, wild space, in my tradition of writing, is never neutral. And it always possesses the power to subvert and transform the relationships that have been established indoors. Outdoors, the forest, the heath, the wilderness and woods can become the politically free space, a tabula rasa on which to rebuild the state. The uncharted wilderness may often also become a sexually open space, a forest of desire in which the subject loses herself. Now the student frees Paul Michel from enclosed spaces and lets him loose in open space. The reader sets the imagination free. Paul Michel is mad not only because he has lost his chosen reader and his muse, the sign of his madness is his delusion that there is only one chosen reader. There is no one single reader or one single reading. The reader is created by the text. Hence, the moment of his capitulation to the disease which claims him is the moment when he begins to write upon himself and becomes the body of his own text. The novel is about kinds of reading. What kind of reading can liberate the imagination? At the end of the novel, the mass of pilgrims climbing to the graveyard represent the readers, the mass of readers who are faithful and unknown. As the Germanist argues in her last letter to Paul Michel, I was your reader too. He was not your only reader. You had no right to abandon me. I began with Shakespeare, and I'm going to end with the last scene of A Midsummer Night's Dream. The sleeping Theseus never knows how thoroughly he has been confounded. As the nobles retire to bed, the fairies invade the palace. They are real, powerful present, and the nobles are lucky that they come not to curse, but to bless. The dark chambers of the court are abandoned. The theatre of the imagination, which is the play, is extinguished. But the fairies returning bring with them the recognition of the dark places that have been evoked throughout the play, but discarded. And you've got on your sheets Puck entering the palace. And these are all the possibilities of things that could have happened, but because we're in a romantic pastoral comedy, have been raised and laid to rest. Now the hungry lion roars and the wolf behowls the moon, whilst the heavy ploughman snores, all with weary task fordone. Now the wasted brands do glow, whilst the screech owl, screeching loud, puts the wretch that lies in woe in remembrance of a shroud. Now it is the time of night, then the graves all gaping wide, every one lets forth his sprite in the churchway paths to glide. And we fairies that do run by the triple Hecate's team from the presence of the sun, following darkness like a dream, now a frolic. Not a mouse shall disturb this hallowed house. I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. Those of you who know the novel, um, who know Hallucinating Foucault, will recognize the screech owl. This, the owl is um, part of the symbolic structure of the text that goes all the way through the book. It is actually both Hegel's owl, but I did think first of Shakespeare's owl, and there is your owl. The, the moment where Paul Michel is first freed from the asylum, 
there's a, a sequence where they're driving down the motorway and it's very, very hot and they stop to have a shower. On French motorways, they have these very fine showers that you can go into and just <gasps> get um, cooled down. And there's a sequence where he's seen dancing in the shower. And that, for me, was the imagination freed so that it can dance. And at the end of A Midsummer Night's Dream, the power of the woods, that is, the fairies, who represent the anarchy of outdoors and the freedom of unlocked spaces, rush in, bringing light and dancing. Thank you very much. <laughs>